Hello, I'm Scott Clover, and you're listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast. This podcast series is about intuition, healing, and creating new energetic patterns that benefit you in your daily life. In my private practice, I help people heal from a diverse range of issues, including self-acceptance, trauma release, managing anxiety, emboldening self-worth, and creative expression. In today's episode, we discuss the experiences of growing up with intuitive abilities, accepting your own intuition, how to use intuition in your everyday life, the ripple effect of being authentic, and the importance of embodiment. Enjoy! Carl Munson here on Radio for a World That Works. It's uh, early evening in Portugal, and I think it's probably just after lunchtime in New York, where my guest today, Scott Clover, uh, joins me from uh, New York City. Hi there, Scott. Hi, Carl. Nice to be here. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. Yeah, well, I, I'm speaking to you probably a week after having one of your wonderful treatments, which is a, a beautiful context for our conversation. And probably I'll return to that to talk about, you know, what sort of effect it's had on me. But this is about you and what you do. And you describe yourself as an intuitive healer. And just before we started recording, you were talking about intuition becoming the next level of evolution, which I think is such a great idea, concept, possibility. Can you, can you start by, by telling us um, what an intuitive healer is? Because you know those memes where it says, you know, like, this is what the world thinks I do. This is what my mum and dad think I do. This is what my friends think I do. Sure. This, is, I, this is what I do. And usually the last one is the most prosaic one, isn't it, of what I actually do. Let's start with that quadrant. What is it you actually do? So I consider myself an intuitive energy healer. And the reason why I include energy in is I have an ability to see and sense energy patterns in and around people's bodies, in their ancestral patterns, in their past life patterns. And I can sense these patterns in and around their bodies or their timelines that helps guide me to explain to the client where their blocks are and why the blocks happened. How does one discover that that is what you do? I mean, as a kid, was it, was it, did you sit on your bed thinking, one day I'm going to be an intuitive healer and, and do this for people? Probably not, not. At, not at all. In the 70s, when I grew up, there were no words for what was happening to me. There were no schools in my neighborhood. There were no uh, people around me that understood what was happening with me that I could bring it up to. And, and it, was, it was so natural to me that I just assumed everyone did it. Yeah. So, no, we didn't talk about it. Kind of like going to the bathroom. Everyone goes to the bathroom, but you don't generally talk about going to the bathroom. You just assume everyone does it a certain way. Well, <laughs> I remember as a child, I used to run energy. I used to run energy through my body if I didn't feel well. I used to not feel well in my gut because I was anxious about something next, someone sitting next to me in school. So I wouldn't want to go to school, and I had a tummy ache. But I think I was just picking up on so much energy that I didn't want to be around that energy that day. I, I had certain classmates over the years that I would sit next to them and I could sense or feel something bad or wrong with them. And that would make me uncomfortable, but I didn't understand what it was. So uh, walking through the, the halls of, of school when I was a young boy, I just remember picking up ideas or senses about people or going into an office and understanding what the women on the back of the office were arguing about, even though I was out of earshot. And I just thought, well, what's going on over there? And I, I just understood what was happening in the argument that I could see like women at this office having, but I didn't know why. Why I was able to understand what was going on 30 feet away from me. Um, it sounds seeing horrible seeing. in many ways. You know, it sounds it sounds horrific to to you know when you especially when you couldn't make sense of it as a kid. And so, when did you start to make sense of that? How how did that become like a an okay and manageable thing rather than a mystery and a possible you know? So the sto yeah. the story yeah. is that around eleven or twelve, I was walking down the hall in, of school, and I remembered certain things I had done with my peers that made them uncomfortable, either knowing too many of the right answers or knowing personal things about them with and just bringing it into conversation freely and them finding it peculiar and i got a distinct sense around i was probably around 11 and a half 12 years old that what i was doing or how i was perceiving energy was not making me popular it was making me weird so i at a certain point i remember the day i was wearing a certain sweater and i was walking down a certain hallway in my middle school and I made the decision to turn off whatever this was that was making me different. 
because different was making me stand out and making me stand out was making me somewhat ostracized. It wasn't happening in full, full force, but I could sense that it was continuing to happen in my peers. So I just stopped interacting with the world that way. Totally um, that. It was an imposed, it was an imposed peer pressure that I wasn't sure there was no storyline. It just was an intuitive hit that if I keep doing this, I will be considered strange. And as yeah. you're a young teenager, that's the last thing you want to be is that different. I was pretty different in, in middle school and high school with hair and fashion and things, but I chose to use that to stand out. And the intuition I really locked away around 12. And then years later, I was, uh, it was explained to me that, hey, maybe you've got some intuition going on up there by, by someone close to me. And I kind of had a mini breakdown of acceptance that if I, have, if I have to continue living like this, then I'm going to have to accept who I am because I can't deny it any longer. And that, that was a real moment. That was a real catharsis and, and scary moment. And that was a little over 10 years ago. So I, I spent see. about five or six years accepting who I was and teaching and learning and learning and any podcast I could listen to or any teacher I could fly to and, and uh, who had certain abilities similar to mine, I would study under them to make sure that I knew what and how I was receiving the energy was appropriate enough to explain it back to people. So in the course of figuring out my intuition and how my intuition worked, I realized that my abilities are really catered to healing. So a lot of my prowess and abilities in terms of intuition are based around helping other people understand how they can feel better in their bodies and in their lives. Wonderful. Okay. So if you want to find out more, it's uh, all the W Scott Clover, Scott with two T's and Clover C L O V E R.com Scott Clover.com intuitive healer. And I, I think that's an amazing journey you described there because you, you kind of turned it off for survival, which, you know, when you're a kid, you have to do things like that to, to, to make sense of the world and to survive in the world. And then it looks or sounds like it became a survival matter to switch it back on because if you carried on with it off, you, there was a kind of dissonance or, you know, repression going on of, of a gift which if you didn't turn it back on, it would be a problem to you. Is that, is that a, an accurate reading of it? Would, would you think your life would be difficult and awkward and kind of you, there would be a sense of dis-ease if you hadn't switched it back on? Yes. I think the challenge that I went through turning it back on was somewhat brutal because of the intensities of my abilities or my perceptions. My satellite dish is quite large. So the, the thing I, the best thing I learned in that course of those first four or five years was how to shut it down again, how to open it up safely, how to cater the energy I'm receiving towards a purpose as opposed to just receiving energy. Have you ever walked into some sports bar and seen 19 televisions on with 19 different sports matches on? There's no way to pay attention to all of those, right? Mm -hmm. But that's when I, when I started opening up again in, in midlife, uh, that's kind of what was happening to me was I would receive 19 televisions worth of information. And it was for me to discern which ones to pay attention to and which ones to ignore. Okay. And that's been the training, is it? To, to learn how to do that. Yeah, finish. that was the training. I call it my aperture. So I open the aperture up in terms of the, of the intuition, especially while I'm, while I'm working. And then in my daily life, going in a subway or walking in a crowded street, I turn it down or almost turn it off so I can survive a, a, a human interaction uh, in New York City with 200 people on a subway car, for example. <laughs> yeah, that's um, understandable. Yeah, so a lot of it was about protection, discernment, and what I call the aperture. And now I utilize it in terms of client sessions. If I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one or a workshop, um, I turn it on to that vibration of healing and what can I perceive in the, in the session or the workshop to bring the most healing potential. So, so who, who, should, who should come? I mean, you, with the work you do, I, I, I see there's two bits to it. There's, you know, there's the, the healing of people and their, their, their blockages and, and traumas and difficulties. And there's also the unleashing of, of abil similar abilities in other people. But who comes? Who comes for that? And who should come for that? 
So uh, my client work is, is generally based in two realms. One is uh, healing, childhood traumas. Uh, I do a lot of somatic work, guided visualizations uh, that are informed by my intuition. So a lot of people come to me because they have childhood traumas. They have uh, been put upon sexually as a child. They have a family situation growing up that was caustic uh, that they want to purge in their, in their older years so they don't have to keep repeating that pattern. That's, that, that's one cornerstone of, of my practice. The, another cornerstone of my practice is artistic expression. So I have a lot of artists that come to me that aren't necessarily blocked, but they know they want to express themselves in maybe more grandiose ways. And so we work together and, and find where their artistic limits are, where they self-perceive they're not allowed to access. And we safely access those places so their creativity expands and their ability or their potential to bring their creativity out and present it to the world gets better. So a lot of artistic expression is stymied by judgment, the fear of judgment of other people. Well, if that starts as a child, you can come to me and we'll figure out a, how it started or who, who blocked you or how that block happened. And then through certain exercises that I've, I've utilized, uh, those blockages sort of disappear or migrate elsewhere. Um, I think you can speak a little bit to that. Too true, yeah. I mean, what I want to say first and foremost about you, my experience of your, your, your session, your, your healing and your, and how you are just generally is that if we go back to that meme of like, you know, what the world thinks I do and what I actually do, mm. the, the kind of old school, old fashioned stereotype of the, the kind of shamanic healing type is, is one of a really kind of esoteric and um, parodied and, you know, cliched and, just not very helpful because which I suppose is, it, it contains people's fear of that, that kind of ability in that person. Um, but the, the great thing is you're not like that at all. You're, you're, what my experience of you and, and you know, people can hear that in this conversation is you're very easy going, very down to earth and it was really good fun working with you. And that is that part of this evolution that you're talking about? This is really actually quite a, uh, can be quite an everyday thing. You know, we're bringing it into our reality now and it doesn't have to be weird or, or, you know, out there or woo-woo and all these sorts of things that it has been in, de in, in decades and centuries past. Has, has the time come for this to become like an everyday tool for us? Definitely, definitely. And, and what I notice most in this uh, industry is it's about embodiment. If you can take your intuition and bring it and ground it in your body, then it's not separate. It's not it's not a, a, a piece of mail you're receiving in the mail and then you have to discern whether I open it or not. It just freely comes to you and you access it and utilize that intuitional moment. I use my intuition a lot when I'm running for the subway. If I'm late for the subway, I'll ask my intuition, when is the next train? And I'll either speed up my walk because I'll know that I'll make it or I won't. And it, it's happening fairly regularly now is I'm utilizing it. I'm using my personal intuition in my day to day, -to -day life more, um, not just in my healing work. So in the healing work that we're talking about, I consider myself a librarian. A client comes to me and they walk into the door of the, the library of healing and there's 32,000 books in there. It's overwhelming. How would the person know which book to, to, to break open and read? So that's, when I, that's where I come in. And I, I say we step inside that library and I will guide you to you know, one of those specific books and show it to you on the shelf. It's your job to open it up and read it. So it's, it's a, a two-way street here as I'm guiding you to the, the healing moment and you have to take, the, the client takes the initiative. So I'm not necessarily as just a healer in the situation, but I'm the guide. The healing I prefer to have done by the person I'm sitting with or the workshop. Yeah. Superb. And that's such a lovely analogy as well, isn't it? Because however unintuitive people think they are, they probably have had one or two experiences in their life, such as walking into a library or a bookshop and the book they needed has presented itself. 
And, you know, so the most cynical sort of negative person would say, that's a complete fluke, me finding that book among 32,000 books. And it, it just happened to be the book that I found that day. And it was, you know, it's a complete coincidence. But that shows, doesn't it, that we have these abilities. And, you know, the example you gave of, of going for the subway, you know, people do that experiment with, with parking, don't they? Like, yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a parking space. My guides are going to find me a parking space. And people have success with that as well. And they have these happenings and they have these successes that are complete. Um, I don't know if proof is the right word, but like, a, like an illustration of their abilities, their natural abilities that they would otherwise not use. Sure. And How many people know who the phone is, who's on the other line of the phone when it rings before they check it? Yes, you know, exactly. That's something fairly, fairly frequent. The, the other thing I notice is people that are uh, finding their intuition challenging or interesting somehow find me. I, I've uh -huh. heard from numerous people, and I believe you even mentioned it, is, you know, when the healer's needed, he shows up. Yeah. And I've heard that from many, many of my clients. Like, wow, how serendipitous that I heard about you at that dinner party, or how serendipitous that I read that article you wrote, and I found you because this is the niche or this is the area in which I need help in. And I hear that frequently. Um, yeah. And the serendipities of life are becoming more and more frequent we have more electric and psychic energy cycling through our planet every year. There's more people, there's more internet, there's more electricity, there's more communication happening all around the globe. So, you know, we mimic our environment. So it's happening in us as well. Yeah, and but what, what I was trying to get at there is how this ability is so close to us and we have, probably have to work so hard to, to keep it at bay and to keep it away and not acknowledge it and not bring it into, you know, our evolution, as you've put it. Yeah. Does, does, that, does that stagger you as well? It's like, you know, how available this is to us, but how little people want to actually engage in that. Definitively, when I first started uh, acknowledging my intuition, trying to accept it, um, it was painful. The energy coming through my brain was being blocked and then received. So it was like hitting water, hitting a dam and then trying its way to, to find its way through. And that's what it felt like for a few years. It, it was painful to go through that process. But as I said, my satellite dish is pretty large, I think in comparative to your average person, but that's why I utilize it for work because I have a certain skill set. Okay. And, and the other part of this, this evolutionary step for us, if that's what it might be, is let's not, um, you know, let's not avoid the fact that in many ways we can read the world at the moment as being in a terrible state. Okay, things are really challenging. I mean, you know, America, let's look at America, the political situation in America, same in, in UK where I'm from. Whilst we have this ability so close to us, why is it that we're allowing on the outside of us these terrible circumstances to occur, it would seem, when we have so much ability to make the world a much more healed and peaceful place, what's happening with that? Why, why, is there, why do you think there's this such, a, such a terrible contradiction or irony at the moment in that? I think that there's expansions and contractions through the universe for millennia. And what we're seeing now is an expansion and a contraction happening at the same time. The contraction is um, global empathy, shall we say? But at the same time, it's, it's allowing people or causing or forcing people to look inward at their own actions. If, if the governments aren't performing to your liking, it means that there's something wrong there. So it's forcing a lot of people and coercing a lot of people to look inward. And I think that's where the revolution is going to be. We're not going to look outward to our politicians or our, our rule makers. We're going to start looking inward more and realizing the authenticity that we challenge ourselves with on a daily basis. I, I feel like I, we should leave it there because that's such a beautiful, positive note to leave it on. And we, and we couldn't wish for a better time, could we, for politicians to be behaving so badly and the systems that they're in to be letting us down so badly to say, you know, there must be some other way than this. Well, I think, there, I think there is another way, and I think that other way is being acknowledged by what we're referring to today, is the embodiment of intuition sort of coerces, challenges, or forces you to be more authentic. And if you accept your intuition, then you're accepting authenticity. 
because the two go hand in hand. And if you start finding inauthentic actions insupportable in your own life, then that will expand or trickle up as opposed to trickling down. Because what's trickling down now is we're at the, seems like we're at the bottom of the cesspool ring. Yes. And so people are really looking inward and saying, I'm going to act appropriately or I'm going to act within my authority. And hopefully that will change the person next to me or the person I interact with in the slightest manner. It's like passing on a smile. It's so radical as well, isn't it? Because all the people throughout history that have been the greatest, most peaceful change makers are looking inside, aren't they? You can tell that from their, from their teachings and what subse subsequently comes out about them. You know, the, the non-violent, peaceful world changers have, have really in some well, way accessed what you're talking about, right? Correct. And it, it, what we're seeing now is an increase in personal empathy. And a, when you understand your own empathy, it's really hard to suffer through narcissism. Mm -hmm. And generally, the, the politicians at work this, in this day and age are so narcissistic and so all about themselves that that will eventually become insupportable to the masses. But right now, the masses are trying to figure out their own sense of self. And once that happens, then it will, it will definitely expand upwards. So Beautiful. I don't see it as positive or negative. I see energy isn't positive or negative. It's just is. It's how we interpret it, how we metabolize it for ourselves is what creates our outside world. Yeah, and I suppose what you perceive as might, that might be negative is just a little sign to you of what, what you might do next or where you might look. Well, it's a teaching moment. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's how can I process this and expand on it as opposed to causing, having it to cause a contraction for me or others. Fantastic. I'm, I'm guessing there are people who will be listening to this, Scott, who think I've got to reach out to that guy and get in touch with myself and my authenticity and my ability and my intuition. Is the best thing for them to do to go to scottclover.com? Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, there's a sign-up sheet there that, that sends me your information. You can leave me a note about maybe what your situation is. Yeah, sessions with me. Uh, the first session runs 75 minutes. Uh, gives us a chance to talk a little bit. I'm not very interested in people's stories, which is how what I, what I deal with is a little different than like a psychotherapist or somebody who's, who's a listener. And yeah. that the stories that people tell from an adult perspective in terms of something they're trying to get over, uh, doesn't resemble very much what the originating pattern or contraction was. And the easiest way I can explain that is if something traumatic happens to someone at eight years old and you relive that trauma 20 times a day for 30 years, and then you come to see me at 38, you've gone through that story thousands and thousands of times in your head and in your body. Just like as a kid, we play the, the, the game Telephone Telegraph. You sit in a circle and one person says, Susie and, and Bobby went to the store for bananas. And by the end of it, you know, Charlie and Tina are doing shots in Tijuana. Like it just, the stories get so convoluted through retelling and retelling and retelling. Now imagine that in your psyche or your body being retold a trauma and, and how it would morph so it would make you feel better. It's not going to cure you, but you're going to try and placate that story enough that you can tolerate or live with it. But it's your body that's going through the trauma. You know, frozen shoulders, uh, frozen knees, people with physical ailments. Generally speaking, those long-term physical ailments probably were precipitated by a, an early childhood trauma. Incredible. And if you don't remember what that story is, or you've convoluted that story for defense purposes, which is very normal, then it's hard to name it. It's hard to cure it. It's hard to get rid of it because you're, you're calling it the wrong thing. So you're sending it essentially, you know, improper medicine. Whereas you come to somebody like me, I'm not interested in your adult story. I'm more interested in where your body's holding the original trauma. And that's my job to help you figure out that. As in like the body never lies, right? Correct. Yeah. Except at night to lie down. That's the only time it lies. Thank God for that. 
And um, I do, I've, I, I've so enjoyed my treatment with you. So enjoyed talking to you today. I wonder if I got a little sort of mischievous question to finish off. Okay, so there are some people who are, would be listening to this, or even just seeing the title and not listening to it because of the title and what they think it's about. What's what do we whisper in the ears of those people who? I don't know, who are really trapped, maybe. Is it, is it, I guess that's a bit judgmental how I'm putting that. But you know how some people just completely cannot compute or don't want to go here with this message or idea? What, what's, what's whispering in the wind to them? My mentor, Dr. Michael Pacucci, who created Focalizing, when I went to see him, he was sort of a holistic psycho, psychologist. And I went to see him years ago. And he was the first person after 20 years of talk therapy getting me nowhere. Um, he was the first person that asked me uh, the, the question that changed my life. And that was, how does my body feel? We sat in session and he said, how does your body feel? I said, what the, f I, I, I don't want to know how my body feels. That's how disconnected I was from my body. My initial reaction was, how dare you ask me that question? Wow. I don't want to feel my body. And once we started working in that, that's when my intuition peeked its head out and said, I'm coming through whether you like it or not. It was because I went back to the body. I started again at 38 with feeling how my body feels. I didn't want to be in my body because of childhood trauma. So embodiment is what I would whisper to somebody. That is the gateway to intuition, to authenticity, to knowing yourself. And that's generally where we would start in a session. Beautiful. How does your body feel? What a great question to leave everybody with. Scott, thank you so much. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast with me, Scott Clover. Thanks to Carl Munson for the great discussion and to Corey Tutt for the music you're listening to. In my private practice, I encourage people to heal what holds you back and feel better in your body. If you need more help with that process, I'm available for healing sessions by phone internationally. Visit scottclover.com for more information. Be well, and thanks for listening.